nation. Yes. We have the responsibility not only to be good and godly and responsible fathers, but we have the challenge to teach our own children the faith that we have. Mm -hmm. And then again, in the sixth chapter of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy, I just want to read verse six and seven because in some ways it is repetitive. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk down on the road. When you lie down and when you get up. Mm -hmm. And then one other verse I want to highlight. In the 11th chapter of Deuteronomy, verse 19, because these all speak to the same thing. Teach them to your children. Yes. Talking about them when you sit at home and when you walk, walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. That's, that's, that's a real challenge. So I really want to ask the question today, and I have to say, I, I, I wish we had a load of young men in here, but I'm going to rely on you to share with some of them what I share with you today. And that is the question, are there any men in the house? Now there are a lot of notions in our culture about what it means to be a man. And not all of those notions lead to strong Christian character. Some people think about being a man as only biologically. I'm male, therefore I'm a man. Some think about it chronologically. I'm 21 years old. I'm a man now. Some think about it in terms of being color and race. I'm a black man. I, I'm a white man. But the color of your skin does not determine the character of your faith. And so there are all of these perceptions about what it means to be a man. Some think of it as physical pro prowess. I, I'm strong. I have lots of energy. I, I, I can do what I want to do. Some think of it in terms of independence. I'm my own man. I can do what I want to do. Nobody tells me what to do. Some think of it in terms of leadership. I'm in charge. I've heard men say, I, I wear the pants in this house. Whatever that's supposed to be. I'm in charge. I was reminded of a story that I heard. I was at an event. And the speaker was speaking and uh, he asked that if he could have a patty. He was about to speak. They were having dinner. And he asked if I could have a patty of butter from my potato. And the waiter said, and he, no. And he said to the waiter, well, do you know who I am? I am the speaker for this occasion. And the waiter responded to him by saying, I am in charge of the butter. <laughs> now some men who see that as manhood. I'm a man. I, I'm in charge. Some perceive as a characteristic of a man as the ability to provide for the family. And that's important. But that's not all that's involved in being a man. I pay the bills. I buy the groceries. I, I provide for the family. That's wonderful and good. But being a man is more than that. Something about manhood in terms of the ability to protect the family. I Protect the family from harm, and that's a good thing. Some think of manhood in terms of position. I'm the boss. Don't mess with me. Don't get in my way. I 
and the boss, therefore, I'm a man. Something about manhood in terms of money and possessions and all of that symbolizes. I make so much money and I, I can do this and I can do that. I can do anything that I want to because I've got enough money to do it. And some men think that because I provide money that everybody in the house must do what I say do. Even the wife. Now, you may not have seen situations like that. But I have. Something about it in terms of turf protection. The, the, the thing that happens in prison life, often touching and hogging and that, that kind of attitude. I'm a man. Something of it in terms of making decisions. I make all the decisions. I'm the man. Don't, don't question anything I do. Don't question anything I say. I am the man. Well, the question is what kind of man are you? Even though you make the decisions, what kind of man are you? Yes. Then there are many, particularly young men, who think of being a man as the ability to give birth to a baby. Wow. They seem to think that if, if, if I can impregnate a woman and cause her to have a baby, then I'm a man. Although a lot of those men, once the baby comes, they go their own way. They don't follow up with support Amen. for the baby and the child. And then some think of being a man. I'm a man. I can have all the women I want. And so they go from woman to woman to woman. What a tragedy. Now, having noted all of those ways in which people see themselves as men, I'm a man, I also understand the struggles that many men face. And it's especially prevalent in the world in which we live today. There are the economic struggles. How do I make a living for my family? How do I care for the people that I say that I love? That can be a challenge to men. and can affect their sense of well-being and can cause them to have some of these other experiences that we talk about in terms of depression. Some trouble, struggle with the challenge of self-esteem, a sense of well-being. There are children who grow up in homes where the father says, you'll never be anything, you'll never amount to anything. And the impact that that has upon a child, and many young men have grown up, they have no sense of well-being, no self-esteem, because they have been beaten down, beaten down by unloving, uncaring, non-understanding fathers. Some men have a challenge in their relationships with women. I've known of couples where the fact of the matter is the woman was smarter than the man. She was more gifted than the man. In some instances, she even made more money than the man. And many men have a real struggle with that. I've counseled with couples. The man is very uneasy because my wife makes more than I do because she has a better job than I do and it makes me feel like I don't count talking about real life situations. There's often the male ego. Pride. No woman's going to tell me anything about what to do. I'm a man. One of the mistakes that many men make 
lies in their unwillingness to listen to their wives. I have observed that women see a lot of things that men don't see. They see a lot of red flags. They see a lot of cautions. They say to their husbands, be careful. Be careful. They see things and sense things that men sometimes don't sense and see, but their pride gets in the way. I'm not going to listen to her. I'm a man. And then there are generational differences. Men who look at their fathers and their grandfathers and they say things like, oh, that's old fashioned. Catch up with the times. And there are generational differences. And then, of course, men, and particularly in our time, face the issue of racism. I think about experiences that I've had. I used to work at General Motors when I was in college. And I'll never forget the day I hired in. The rumor was that all men of color, African Americans, all they could do was be janitors. And so when I hired in, I, they asked me the question, have you ever done any office work? And I said to them, well, I had bookkeeping in high school, and I won some honors. And the, he said, fine, come with me. And he took me to the general manager's office, and he gave me a broom and a mop bucket and a dust cloth. Office work. Can you imagine? And that could have embittered me for life. But I knew that God had something more in store with me. And there's nothing wrong with being a janitor because to this day, when I fill out my resume, I always put on that janitor. Because I understood they could not define me with the humiliation. <coughs> That's an issue that men can face, and particularly men of color. When you know, I had a foreman who wanted me to help him fill out his reports because he didn't know how to do it. I'm the janitor, he's the foreman, and I'm supposed to help him fill out his reports. I tell you what, I'm not talking out of thin air. Talking about the reality of life. And then peer pressure. Men face that reality. Looking at what other men are doing. And sometimes that peer pressure takes them down very debilitating and troubling roads. It's that old attitude when everybody's doing it, so I might as well do it. A lot of men think that way. And then there are men who, because of domestic difficulty, have to be single parents. There are men who are taking care of the children. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. But that can be a challenge to men when they've got to be both the mother and the father in the home because there's been a division in the home. And the home has broken down. Stereotypes about men and women can be a challenge. You hear people say, well, men are this way. Or women are this way. Well, there may be some men who are that way, and there are some women who are that way, but thank God there can be godly fathers and men who are not that way. Very times. Think for a moment about 
the people who have most influenced your life. Whether in a good way or in a negative way. I tell you, it, 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 it can be far-reaching. I was moved this morning. My son gave me a Father's Day card, and here's what it says. What is a dad? He's someone who shows his love in little ways that mean a lot. In bits of wisdom shared, reassuring hugs, and, sli and smiles that say, good job. And quick reminders, a silly joke, and in all the special ways he has of being there for his family. Whether you're helping out, giving advice, solving the problem, or we're just having some fun, you put love into everything you do. Thanks for being the best dad anyone could ever have. Now my prayer and hope is that every father could get that kind of feedback from his son and that every father would so live and so model what it means to be a godly father that our sons, your sons, could rise up and say, this is the kind of dad I have. It's a blessing. It's a blessing. It's a blessing. Now there are passages in the Bible dealing with wives and children, but today's focus is on fathers. And we need strong, loving, caring, exemplary fathers who both teach and model the kind of life that their sons want to emulate. Godly fathers make better husbands. Someone has said that the best lesson you can show to your children, husbands, is how you treat their mother. The way a man treats his wife sends a message. One of the reasons we have so much abusiveness in our society is because there are men who have abused their wives and their children pick that up and they come to think that that's the way a woman ought to be treated. That is sad. Well, I have five married grandsons. It is a part of my effort to offer them wise counsel and encourage them to model a lifestyle that Christ desires for Christian fathers. I've sent each of them a set of guidelines to assist them in being God godly fathers. Now, these are not original with me, but I concur in the wisdom. Let me share some of this with you. I sent this to them just a few days ago, and it's timely for Father's Day. The author is a man who wrote to his son. He said, in a few days our oldest son will marry. I have no coherent advice to offer on planning a wedding. But he says, based on 24 years experience, I can offer a few bits of advice on how to navigate marriage. So here we go. These are the things that he said to his son. He took his lead from Proverbs chapter 4 where it says, Listen to a father's instruction. Pay attention and gain understanding. Mm -hmm. These are things that he said to his son who's about to be married. If you want to have a good marriage, if you want to have a godly marriage, if you want to be a godly father, here are some things he says. Praising your wife in front of others does wonders for her self-esteem. Men, do you ever praise your wife in front of other people? Some men are good at criticizing your wife. He 
he says, criticizing her in front of them, even in jest, is always a bad idea. And then he says, sometimes she doesn't need you to solve her problems. She just wants you to listen. Say, I, I know, I don't understand either. One of the things that my wife was marvelous at, she would leave me notes. And sometimes when I was in a state of stress and pastor of a church and dealing with issues, she would leave me a note that said, honey, I don't understand, but I want you to know that I really do care. A word of encouragement, a word of support. Don't fall for that line of garbage that marriage is a ball and chain. Sometimes, as, in, as impractical as it seems, it's better to spend $500 on a trip than on furniture, provided you have the money. Sometimes we think we're doing the favor when we buy some expensive item, and that's not the answer. Sometimes we need to say, let's go away for a few days. And that makes a difference. And then he talks about the credit card debt is a monster. Don't fall for it, even short term. And don't keep financial secrets. They never remain secret. Live on less than you make if possible. Live on one income. Swim against the tide. Be stewards not consumers. It's sad that in our community, on, in our world on television, you may have just gotten a new refrigerator, but they tell you next year another model comes out and you need another new one. Or you may have just gotten a new car and they say next year you need another one. And many families are sunk in deep debt, which adversely affects their relationship. He says, tithe. Not only does it honor God, it brings focus to the rest of your money decisions. And then he goes on to say, laughing together is better than exercising together. You ever have a good laugh in your home? Even sometimes odd and strange things that happen, but they call forth real laughter. Our kids have done things. And we haven't understood it, but we've laughed. Uh -huh. And laughter has a way of binding and bringing people together. He says, don't be so afraid of hurting each other's feelings that you never talk about how you really feel. He said, it took me five years to tell your mom I didn't like the grape jelly she'd been putting on my peanut butter sandwiches. <laughs> Sometimes, and, and, and a lot of that has to do with relationship. A relationship where we can talk to each other, even with differences of opinion. 